introduction. <laughs> um, it almost made me cry talking about my parents and how they how they really lived out hospitality. And I know that's where I got my spirit of hospitality from. And it's very heavy with me. So I want to thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I said if I go too long, stop me, because I, I uh, tend to speak too long. So just feel free to say stop. <laughs> I worked in the inner city for many years. And I would see people, um, homeless men on the streets, I would see people gathered on corners, and I would think, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I thought, somebody needs to be helping them. And then I would pick up homeless men at night off the streets. I would take them to homeless shelters, only to find that the homeless shelters refused them. And that shocked me, because I believed that every homeless shelter existed to take in all the homeless. Then one night, one winter night, it was brutally cold out with heavy snow. And it was a time when three churches on the east side of the city opened up their basements for the homeless. And I was driving down the street at night, and I saw a man walking down the street, and I thought, this is too cold for him to be outside. Uh, he'll freeze to death. Then I saw where he was heading, which was to one of the homeless, one of the churches that was opening up its basement. So, but the doors of the church were locked. And I thought, well, why don't they open the doors earlier? It's freezing outside. But they didn't do it. So I picked up the three men, put them in my car to keep them warm, and we drove around the city, and then we came back to the shelter, to the church, and we went downstairs in the basement, and I said, I have about three homeless men here. Um, would you take them in? And they said, no. And that shocked me. They said they had 10 men, and they had no more room for anyone else. So I begged them, and they said no. So I asked them, would you please call one of the other churches, see if they'll take them in. Uh, and the actor said no, they had seven men, and they had no more room. And I thought, something is wrong with this. So I got them, and they took one man in. So I had two left. And I didn't want them to call the other church, because it's too easy over the phone to refuse. <laughs> so I took the two men over to the third church, and we walked down the basement, and I said, I have homeless men here, would you take them in? And they said, no. They had 10 homeless men. They didn't have any more room. So by then, I had it. And I said, well, then I'm not leaving unless you take them in. <laughs> and they took them in. <laughs> but that night, I could go home with peace of mind knowing that the men were, were warm and sheltered. But all I could think of that night was no room in the end. Relived and relived and relived in our history. And it was then that it struck me that there needed to be a place in Rochester, a homeless shelter in Rochester, that was open 24 7, that would welcome every homeless person and not put them out at 6 o'clock in the morning to go who knows where. So they thought was in my mind, the seed was planted. And it reminded me of uh, Linda Gately, she, when she was discerning what she was going to do with her life. And she wanted to start a hermitage. She wanted to go to a hermitage in the desert. And when she was discerning what to do, this is part of what she said in the call. I know in my very guts that now is the time I must say yes. I do not fully understand what I am doing, nor why. I only know I must go with my doubts and my pain. For however crazy this seems, anything else would be senseless betrayal of my own integrity and truth. But I'm not on my own. So I thought, I have to open up a shelter. And I thought, wait a minute, I have no money. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, I'm a sister of mercy. <laughs> so I'll go to the sister of mercy and ask them to help me get a shelter. So I did. I submitted a proposal. And they gave me $30,000 for the year and said I would have to do my own fundraising. Well, I had never done any fundraising in my life. But I didn't tell them that. I just took the grant and the lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was looking at, home, at storefronts, but I found a small house with five small rooms. So I thought, I'll name it House of Mercy after Catherine Colley, the founders of the Sisters of Mercy, who opened up House of Mercy for the poor in Dublin, Ireland. Catherine would go out and look for the poor and bring them in. So I thought I'd do the same thing. 
I didn't have to because when I opened up the House of Mercy, the people flocked to us. So on October 1st, 1985, 30 years ago, we opened up the House of Mercy on Central Park. For the day I opened, I had no phone, just a desk. I called a telephone company to install a phone. So the man came, I had to run an errand, ran it, came back, no phone, no telephone man, and the door was wide open. So I called a tel telephone company, I said, where is this technician? So they connected me to him. So I said to him, there's no phone. And the door is wide open. He said, I got scared. I said, well, you come and install the phone. Will you be there? I said, yes, I'll be here. So I stayed with him until he installed the phone. And the next day, a police officer saw me standing outside the House of Mercy. And he practically took the curb and he said, and jumped out of the car and he said, what are you doing here? Don't you know this place is dangerous? I said, well, this is where the church needs to be. It's silence time. So, the house opened. The first month, over 600 people came to us for help. The next month, over 700. Over 1,000, over 2,000. Today, we have over 4,000 people a month that come to the House of Mercy for help. We quickly became a drop-in center, outreach center, and a homeless shelter. And we're distributing food and clothing, everything that people needed, we encouraged to get for them. The first cries I heard were from mothers. I have no food, my children are hungry. I have no beds, my children are sleeping on the floor. I have no stove, I have no refrigerator. And all that was true, because I would see in the wintertime when I visited the homes, when I visited the homes, that many people put their food on the outside window ledge, that was their refrigerator in the wintertime. I found young people, too many young people with no teeth. I found sick people not going to the doctors because they lacked medical insurance. I found too many people who couldn't read or write, adults and children, and who were very embarrassed by it. There was a 21-year-old young man who came to me in my office and he said, I can't read. But he, does, he didn't want anybody else to know this. And he said, my mother will ask me a word and I'll guess at it and I'll tell her. But I, he said, I got away with it because she can't read either. I found a lot of that. I found a 62-year-old woman who could not tell time because she couldn't read numbers. I found people penniless, homeless, people being evicted, they couldn't afford their rent, <clears throat> RG&E shutoffs because they couldn't afford their, their utility bills. And I was told by landlords that before the House of Mercy opened, they would see people going to dumpsters for food. And that stopped when the House of Mercy opened. Bible studies and liturgies. I found people going to agencies for help only to be refused, so they stopped going. And recently, in the past few years, children started coming to the House of Mercy. And to listen to their stories, they came from abusive households, um, one in particular, he had a grandmother that was um, taking care of him, the foster grandmother. And they would come to the House of Mercy every day from morning till night, morning till night. And I thought, something is wrong here. Why, are th why is this family here all day long? And it was because I discovered they had not had electricity for over two years. So every day they would stay all day and all night. And then we, we, I said to the social workers, I said, you know, they don't have electricity, uh, something should be done. And they said that um, it wasn't their problem, that it wasn't serious enough to do anything about it. And that really got to me. So we paid for the electricity to be turned in their home. And it cost, it was expensive because over the years, the wires had deteriorated. And then the young boy, young, Glad he was five years old, he got so he didn't want to go home. And he would cry and hold on to everything just not to leave the House of Mercy. And I thought, what, what is going on? So he cry. every time it was time for him to go home, he'd cry. And then one night, I went home with him. He was in the back seat of my car crying. He didn't want to go in the house. 
and then he heard his aunt was there. He asked me to walk in with him. I walked in with him, and then we heard his aunt was upstairs, so we started to walk upstairs, and the foster grandmother shouted out, you can't go up there. With that, the little boy found out, out of the house, ran down the street. It was 11 o'clock at night, dark street. I thought we'd lost this little boy. Then he came back. He was sitting in the back seat of my car crying, and I brought him to the house of mercy. And that night, he and I slept in my office. Uh, he was on two chairs. I was on two chairs. I said, never more, never again will he go back to that household. And I found out that he had been beaten, slammed against the wall, sexually molested. All this abusive stuff was going on in his household, and he did not want to go back. So he lived with us for three years. And now he's reunited with his mother, and hopefully things are better for him, I hope. But what shocked me more than ever when we, because we opened the House of Mercy to help people live in dignity, to get on their feet, we were burying them, one after the other. And we didn't even have time to grieve. It was, you'd hear about one person dying, then another would die, and the families would come to us and say, you know, someone died in their family, we don't know what to do, will you help us? So quickly we got into the burial issue. In two weeks we buried five people. In three months we buried 25 people. And we always gave them dignified Christian burials. And I'll just tell you one story quickly. Uh, there was a homeless man who came to us, and he was with us for a while. We got him into an apartment. But every night, he kept coming back to the House of Mercy to sleep. So we asked him, why, why are you coming back here? We didn't say anything to him. We just let him come every night because he missed the camaraderie and the community that are formed in the House of Mercy. And that's what happens with the homeless. They form community, they become friends, and it's hard to separate. So he kept coming to the House of Mercy every night and sleeping. And then one morning, he didn't wake up. He had died during the night. And we planned his funeral. And at the wake, he was in his 50s, and at the wake, his, the mother of his children came. She was in her 50s. And there's a place of funerals for remarks. So she got up at the funeral and she said, I always worried about Woody. And my biggest worry was that he would die all alone on the street with nobody to care for him. And in her grief, she said, but I am so happy that when he died, he died in the House of Mercy, surrounded by friends. And we have many stories like that. Now, the House of Mercy refuses no one. We're open 24 seven. We take in the people nobody else wants. Police bring homeless people to us. Hospitals send hopeless people to us. We get the mentally ill, and we're not going to help from the county that we need to work with our mentally ill, but we'll keep them because we don't want them out in the cold. And so whoever needs help, we take them in. We refuse no, no one. And actually, we're the last stop for people that need help. When they have no place else to go, they come to the House of Mercy. So we feed them, we clothe them, and we help to move them on in their lives. We believe very strongly in hospitality. And I love what Henry Nouwen, he's a Dutch theologian, a great spiritual writer, I love what he says about hospitality. He says, in our world full of strangers, estranged from their own past, culture, and country, from their neighbors, friends, and family, from their deepest self and their God, we witness a painful search for an hospitable place where life can be lived without fear, and where community can be found, and where strangers can cast off their strangeness and become our fellow human beings. And that's what we try to do at the House of Mercy in the spirit of hospitality. Even Pope Francis opened up a shelter in Rome, right? You heard about that, right? It says Pope Francis had showers and barber service installed for the poor and homeless people under the colonnades in St. Peter's Square, and he opened a hostel to provide beds for many of them at night. He has organized a visit for them to the Vatican Museums, and in countless ways has sought to affirm their dignity as human beings. So Pope Francis did it too. Now, but history repeats itself. 30 years ago, I was faced with the problem of homelessness in the city. And I'm sure you all followed the news. Homeless evicted from the Civic Center garage, August 2014. 
We begged the county not to evict the homeless until a building was found for them. Our cries fell on deaf ears. So we set up a meeting for September 9th with the county to discuss the situation. We had a meeting scheduled. Then about a few days before the meeting was to be held, I received a phone call saying there would be no meeting. And I begged them to hold the meeting. There were many people involved and we needed a place for the homeless. Again, our cries fell on deaf ears. So we protested, as you heard, at the county building, demanding a meeting with the authorities of the county who would still refuse to meet with us. So as we were protesting, the police ordered us out of the building. We refused to leave, so three of us were arrested on September, 25th, September 15th, 2014. We were charged with third degree criminal trespass. <laughs> but we received an ACD adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. So then after that, nothing was being done. We established Tent City at Washington Square Park. Remember the tents we had across from St. Mary's. Uh, they were September 2014, and the homeless kept coming. We kept buying the tents, and they kept coming. And then the city forced us to evacuate that area. So that night when I went back and told the homeless, we have to leave this area, but keep the tents wherever you go, then I asked them, where do you want to go? And they said, under the uh, Douglas uh, and Susan B. Anthony Memorial Bridge. And that night, it was a, really a sight to behold to see there were the homeless and all the people from the community that came to help carrying these tents that are already pitched open, carrying these tents blocks from, from the park to, were you there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were there that night, right. From the park to uh, under the bridge, and there they stay for, um, for a month or so, two months or so. And they were happy there. And uh, they really were happy and they loved it even though it was just a tent they were living in. But then you remember too that um, there was a demolition of the tents at Sanctuary Village. It was very, very hard, it was heartbreaking to witness the demolition. We got the news too late. We didn't know this was happening. So by the time we got there, some tents had been demolished. Others were still standing. So we stood before these tents that were still there to prevent them from tearing down every tent. Everything was destroyed. What little they had in the tents, but especially their ID. And ID is very hard to get. So they, they were mourning the, the tents being gone, but also the fact that their ID was lost. And one man said to me, he said, you know, I had my tent. It was my little home. I would go take a walk. And in taking a walk, I knew that I had a place to go to. And it was his tent. And he said, when I came back and found my tent destroyed, he said, I was heartbroken. And he said, I don't know what to do now. And then he said, there was a Christmas tree that had been decorated that was put right there in that area. And he said, when I saw the Christmas tree was gone, he said, I cried. So what did we do? We bought more tents. <laughs> and they, no one was happy about that except the homeless. We bought more tents and built up the village again. And then if you remember, downtown United Presbyterian Church opened up their uh, gymnasium for two weeks. And then after that, Sanctuary Village opened up on a loading dock on Canal Street. Uh, Ken Glazer from Buckingham Properties gave us his property. There was no heat, no running water. And um, the DeMarco companies installed the heat for us and we were able to take care of the water, bringing in water. Um, and the city helped us with our liability. So we were there for about three months. Over 75 homeless people came to this shelter and they were happy. It was a beautiful place, really. And a woman who was in her 50s, I was talking to her while she was there and she said, you know, she said, I love it here. She said, I'm so happy. Everyone is so good to me, so kind to me and so helpful. And they're even helping me to find an apartment. And then she said, for the first time in my life, I'm beginning to love myself. And that story stays with me. It's like a haunting thing. Now, there was a, a volunteer at um, Sanctuary Village. And when Sanctuary Village was forced closed, he wrote this letter to us. It is sad that something so important to so many lives 
has ended unnecessarily when it was doing so much good. In three, they will soon have another place where they can restart Sanctuary Village. This was one of the more enlightening and meaningful experiences in my life. I made many good friends. I'll continue to pray for them. And God willing, maybe I'll see the whole family again at a new facility. The day after Sanctuary Village closed, as some of you may know, a fence was erected right in the area where the tents were under the Memorial Bridge. And we knew why, but the truth was never really told to us. So we kept searching and searching for a building for the homeless. We looked at over 41 buildings. And today, thank God, we can say that we finally found a permanent building for our chronic homeless which due to renovations will not be ready until the fall. But in the meantime, we were concerned about the homeless they would be out in the cold this winter. And so we opened up Reach Home and Reverend Peter Peters is here. He's heading it, right? Yeah. And it's going, it's moving beautifully, right? And you have over, should I say how many, over 30 that are coming in. And so the homeless are being taken care of this winter, but that is temporary until our Ormond Street um, building is opened up. Uh, this Reach uh, home is on Prince Street off of East Main, downtown. And there's some wonderful people that are working there and meeting the homeless and loving the homeless and taking care of the homeless, and the homeless are very happy. Now soon we'll be launching a capital campaign uh, for the new building, which will be larger and hopefully will accommodate maybe 100 homeless, we're thinking big, um, and we have to have money for innovations, operations, we'll need a larger staff and all that, so de definitely we'll need money. But I want to read a letter that I got from someone um, about a homeless person that he met, that he met on the street. And he said, I first met Cleveland 10 to 15 years ago. This was written in 2013 when he asked me for money to buy shoes for his kids. Of course, I didn't believe him and resented his approaching me. This took place, by the way, right outside St. Mary's Church downtown. Well, over the years, I'd see him around since I worked downtown. Sometimes he'd ask for money, and sometimes he wouldn't. Sometimes I gave him a dollar, and sometimes I wouldn't. Once I gave him a Kennedy half dollar, and when he saw what it was, he got a great smile on his face and happily walked away talking about JFK. It wasn't until a little over a year ago that I actually had a conversation with him. He'd be outside the YMCA when I'd arrived at 5 o'clock a.m. to work out. By then, he'd been accepted by a couple of the guys who worked at the Y. They'd let him come in and out of the cold and got him a cup of coffee and a couple of dollars. It was then that I realized how selfish and rejecting I'd been of Cleveland. I started to say hello, to ask how he was doing. And finally, after all this time, what his name was. <clears throat> he told me he was Cleveland Green, but that some people called him Stevie. He said he'd been put out of various shelters and apartments and that's what happens to many of the homeless. They're put out, put out, put out. I, when I last saw him, he said he was now at the House of Mercy, and we at the Y agreed that you would be taking good care of him. <clears throat> then I saw his funeral notice in the paper. I went to his wake and was surprised to see how large a family he had. I spoke to an aunt who was very gracious she shared how sweet he was as a young man growing up and how he always had the most beautiful smile. I'm ashamed that it took me so long to see Cleveland as a human being and not as some undesirable bother who seemed to always be in my way. I realize now that Cleveland was ministering to me all along. I just hadn't realized it. Thank God, I finally did. 
And so he was there at the funeral. We always um, tried to bury our own homeless. And that's another issue we have with the county, but I'm not going to go into that now. Um, now, I was asked when I was invited to come here how, in spite of criticism and arrest, I remain unafraid of the work I do on the streets of Rochester. And it's not an easy question to answer. My response would be, when you feel you are being called by God to do a work, you must answer. It is the work of the Spirit of God calling, 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 and not letting go. It doesn't go away. It's mysterious. It's persistent. The voice within you that says, go and do this. So you know if you don't answer that call, you'll never know true peace. And I'm, you know, I love the story in the Old Testament of Moses when he was called by the Lord to free the Israelites. Moses, see, as the story is told in Exodus, Moses sees a burning bush and he goes over to it. And then he hears a voice from the bush calling him, Moses, Moses. And Moses responds, here I am. Then the Lord says, and these words have always gripped me. I have witnessed the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have witnessed the affliction, the suffering of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry. I know well that they are suffering. I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians. Now, come now, Moses. I will send you to Pharaoh to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses is afraid. Wait a minute, Lord, who am I that you should tell me to go to this great Pharaoh that everybody fears and tell him to let my people go? And the Lord says, go. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. And then Moses says, Lord, I'm not a man of eloquence. I can't even speak well. He says, well, your brother Aaron will help you do that. But go. And so Moses went and freed the Israelites with the Lord's help. That's a calling. You don't stop and think. You go and do what, is, what you're being asked to do. You know, I don't often tell this story, but um, if you remember last winter, February was a really a harsh winter. And when the men were still in the Civic Center garage, um, it was a horrible night. Um, I was at the House of Mercy, and all our homeless are taken care of. They're warm, they're fed, they're safe. And I thought, good, now everybody is okay. But then suddenly, I thought, what about the men in the shelter, in the, in the Civic Center garage? You know, I couldn't rest with it. It was a bad night, a horrible night. I thought, I've got to find out how the men, the homeless, in the Civic Center are doing. I thought, but it's so bad outside. And I thought, I'll be lucky if I get there alive. But you know, I had to go. And I went. The streets were not plowed. It was a horrible night. So I got into the shelter, into the Civic Center garage. The men were hungry. They were cold. They needed blankets. So I called the House of Mercy, my staff, I said, get all the blankets we have in the House of Mercy and all the food we have and bring it all down here to the garage. I thought they were going to say to me, you're crazy. <laughs> but they did. They came down with blankets and food. And after a while at the garage, I could go, again go home in peace, knowing that even the people in the garage were okay. Now, and Edwina Gately says, and I'll close with this, um, she says, and it, when she felt she was being called to the desert to open up a hermitage, I'm preparing to move into an old trailer in the forest. For some strange or wild reason I don't fully understand, I feel I must. In my guts, I am afraid. I do not want to have much time to think or even to pray as I plan what to take and what to eat. That's how I felt that night. I don't want to think anymore of how I feel. 
I have to go see how the homeless are doing in the Civic Center garage. So you don't think. You just know you're inspired, the call is there, and you have to do it. Otherwise, I could never have rested that night. And that's what she is saying here. I can't even think or even to pray as, as I plan what to take and what to eat. For if I do, I may stand and cry aloud, no, I cannot go. Is it that I fear the ultimate encounter, the solitude, the loneliness? What is it that I fear? But then a strange force, force within her says, says, go. Go do what you are being called to do. And that was it when a... Uh, Gately, and I read her because I have the same feelings that she has, uh, that she was called, I was called, and I know many of you have gone to, through the experience of being called to do something, um, of going out of yourself to help someone else who is in need. So that's what I have to say today. If you have any questions, um, I'd be glad to take them. of you out there. And you're out there too doing your thing, right, Barbara? Well, for those of us who are not being, hearing any calling, can you call to us? Can, what, what should we be doing? Oh, yes, okay. Well, I know Rich needs help, right? Now, you want to tell them about your needs? I know you need food. Yeah, if they go on the, to, um, to the website to uh, rog uh, uh, reachrogester.com or .org, uh, you can find out where you can volunteer. Yeah, I know that at night they need uh, cooked food coming in every night uh, because they don't have the cooking facilities there, which was the same thing as at uh, St. Street. When we open up Ormond Street, which hopefully will be in the fall, this fall, uh, we'll need everything. We'll need money, we'll need volunteers, we'll need people to bring in all the donations that we need, blankets, cots, uh, food, clothing. Uh, whatever the people need, we'll need a lot of it, a lot more than we need now because we'll have many more homeless. And we'll need, we'll need many volunteers to come in and spend time with the homeless and also take them to appointments they have because we try to get them on their feet, get them into housing, or they have uh, doctor's appointments. Uh, we, we could use volunteers in coming and, you know, even just sitting there and talking with our homeless and getting to know them and then helping them to get into housing, helping them to make their appointments. And as the woman said, you know, Sanctuary Village, help them to feel loved, that there are people out here who love them, who care for them, and will be compassionate and, and stay with them. Um, it's not always easy, but it is rewarding. Um, somehow a change happens within us. And when we hear their stories, um, we're really moved. I was telling someone today when we have our Mass, our liturgy on Sundays uh, at the House of Mercy at 12 o'clock and the homeless are there, there were two, in incidents when, two instances when homeless men would look up at me and they would say, I'm so happy here. I am so happy. I've never been this happy before. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And they would repeat it. And, and I would say, oh, Lord, I said, this is a homeless shelter. It's not a home, it's a homeless shelter. But it is home to them. But when you hear statements like that from them, it does something to you. It's like, yes, we're in the right place doing what we need to do. And the Lord will bless the, bless the work. Are you coming to tell me it's over? We can take one or two questions if, if we have any. Is it possible to put a figure on the homeless population of either the city or of Monroe County? Well, they say if you count all the homeless that are on the streets in homeless shelters and those who are living in apartments with people and they're really not welcome there, but they're there, maybe about 8,000. Um, but if you talk about the homeless that are on the streets right now, there probably are more than 100 that are still out in the streets that we need to take care of. Um, so the number is larger than what people think. And I think that what happened last winter really brought out the issue of the homeless here in Monroe County. Um, and the beauty of uh, last winter, too, was the community coming forth to help us. People just flocked to the tents where we were, 
and even a sanctuary village and brought food and clothing and volunteered their time. They, were, they even brought books for them to read and games for them to play. And um, the homeless were always extremely, extremely grateful. And they loved the food. Um, and then also the food coming in, we have snacks out, we can take, there's food out all day long, so they always have something to eat. Uh, so food is, will be necessary. Uh, cots, blankets, right now, you know, we're begging for gloves, for winter, for boots, for heavy jackets, a large sizes from extra large to 5X. Um, really, we, we could use 5X. And boot size 14, uh, we don't always get those. So anything, you know, really anything you would need is what they need, only in, in larger numbers. So, you know, and volunteering would really help us to be sure that every homeless person is taken care of and we'll get to the doctors and we'll eventually get on their feet. Reverend Peter? Um, Bridge Home will go out of existence uh, in the uh, end of the winter season. We can help with uh, the community, you know, begging the county to open up shelters for the homeless. Uh, and there's also talk of maybe opening up a separate woman's shelter, you know. Um, uh, that, is imp that needs to be done, a woman's shelter, which will make it easier than the house of men. We won't need as many beds, but a uh, woman's shelter is one that's needed also. Yes? Do uh, you think that uh, homelessness has increased in, me in metro areas in general, not just Rochester, because of uh, closures of, of places like um, Terrence and Willard and Buffalo's Richardson Complex? Not that those places were necessarily uh, good places either. That, that, I mean, that they're there was mistreatment there that it could have been reformed or the proposed way. Do you, do you think that's the case? I'm sorry, did you ask the question? Yeah, with the closure of places like uh, cuts in mental health and, and closing mental facilities. Oh, yeah. Well, th this is what happened in Rochester when the, when the psychiatric center was closed in the 70s. Uh, they were put on the streets. There was no one there to help them. And now they had problems. They were homeless, and now their children our adults now and they're homeless, so it has perpetuated itself. Uh, and we do need help with the mentally ill. Uh, that's, a, that's a weakness we find that when we homeless, when we have a mentally ill person come to us, it's sent to us, generally by hospitals or brought in by police, and we'll take them in and we'll work with them. But if they get to a point where they need mental health and we try to get them into a hospital for help, they're there for maybe a night or two, and they're sent right back into the community again. Right. And they come right back to us. And so sometimes it's like we have a mental war, you know, uh, because we can't get the help that we need, you know, um, for our mentally ill. That's an area also that we could have people help us with if you could get to the county and say, look, our mentally ill that are out on the streets need help. And would you reach out to help them? We do need the help. We can't do it all ourselves. And it is a community problem, and it's a Monroe County's responsibility to take care of all the poor, uh, which is mandated um, by the state that the county is to take care of the poor in Monroe County. Yes? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your talk. And I'm really, um, I'm really I'm so impressed with how you work with people and, and, uh, and give them dignity. They're not asking us. <laughs> we haven't been consulted. <laughs> We're ready, but we haven't been consulted. And you know, we are in the quadrant that is, you know, the real, the po real poverty area in the, in the city. Um, the real poverty area in Monroe County. We're right there where the poverty is. Um, but you know, we love being there. We love our people, and they know that they know we love them. And when I first opened up the House of Mercy in 1985, people said to me, we were here for a long time and nobody cared for us until you came along, the House of Mercy opened. And now they're saying if the House of Mercy were ever to close, they don't know what they would do. But we have no intentions of closing. With your help and the help of the community, we'll be able to get Ormond Street going. And the joy in Ormond Street will be, never again can anyone say to our homeless, you must leave at this date. That is one of the hardest things to go through. It's very heartbreaking. 
and I know when Sanctuary Village was forced to be closed, I was so distraught that for months, I just wasn't myself. Sister. Yeah, so there's, you know, oh, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. How can people get in touch uh, if they do want to learn more or volunteer or donate? Uh, well, we, we have our web, you know what, I meant to bring um, one of our bookets with us. Uh, we're, we're in the phone book uh, and we're on our website and probably that's not the best answer for me. I mean, I'm, I just use a phone. <laughs> Uh, but if you have, if, if they want more information, I can give it to you. When you okay, can, and yeah. we can put it on our website, yeah. uh, ffrpl.org. So we'd be happy to post that information. All right, Sister Grace, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. thank you all for coming. And remember next week, Jody Gage with the Amherst. I hope we'll see you all. Thank, thank you. you. Are you feeling? A war for order, a war for gold, a war for money, and a war for souls. War on terror, war on drugs, war on kindness, and war on hugs. War on birds and a war on bees. They got a war on hippies trying to save the trees. War with jets and a war with missiles. War with high seated government officials. Wall Street, war on high finance. War on people who just love to dance. War on music, war on speech, war on teachers and the things they teach. A war for the last five hundred years. There are so many voices this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester, Rochester Indiana.